Charles, welcome back to the show. How are you? Thank you. I am so glad to be on during the twilight of uh, this show, if you want to call it that. I'm nervous about anything you might write about this show. (laughs) It's your critic. This show has done so much to support local music here. That's something I don't know if your other guests have said, uh, but... You know, what you guys have done to kind of keep the focus on bands here and not not a lot of morning radio in this region has done that. And that's been such a great uh, contribution to this regional music scene. Well, thank you. And uh, I tell you, no one thought we should do it or could do it. And for the longest time, I just thought we were getting away with it. But I also figured... Um, you know, so much in, in uh, broadcasting, and it's got to be this way. It's the business. It's about getting ratings, and it's about getting them fast and holding on to audiences. And so uh, taking the, you're taking a risk anytime you do something that's more for a long-term relationship. You know what I mean? Like some shows develop, and they have really good long-term relationships, but they do stuff that you couldn't get away with doing right now because people would want it to happen really quick. And so w- by meeting all of these local bands, I just figured people would say, ah, I hate that one. Oh, I like this one. That sucks. Why did they put it on? But over time, they'd go, you know, I'm hearing stuff I never would have heard. And, you know, that's why I think part of why the show has been great is that I think we have a special audience. I don't think that you can measure an audience just in numbers. I think it's what kind of people are they? They're a little bit open-minded. Well, they are. They're looking for a relationship, and that's the one thing you guys have brought. It's the relationship with you, Mm -hmm. but they're willing to trust. It's like uh, Spike and, and, uh, you know, his wife, uh, you know, it's like, try this restaurant. Okay, Mm -hmm. so you trust. Over time, you start to learn, and you, you know, you guys have brought a lot of music to a lot of ears. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that somebody continues doing that. I actually have um, in mind turning that part of what the show does into a podcast and continuing to do it with anybody who wants to help. And somebody needs to, because I think it goes back to when we were at KISW, uh, you know, there was Damon Stewart that we worked with and he had the new Mm. music hour and we were hearing new music from little bands like Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And Mm. these were bands that nobody really knew about until Damon started playing them on KISW. And when that went away, there was really no place for local bands to be. And I almost felt like that, Bob, that we kind of took it on as a, as, as, because nobody else was doing it. And it was a responsibility almost to the city. Charles, let me ask you this because uh, I read you a, a lot. And um, you're very savvy about a lot of things. And you've seen the evolution of the music business, which right now in some ways is in shambles. And in some ways... It's easier for someone to put something out globally than it ever has been before. Uh, where are we? Are we at a new? Are we at the dawn of a new renaissance? Because right now there's a lot of pop garbage out there, but there's also a possibility for anyone with an idea to be creative. If you're, if you are looking towards the future of music, what do you see? Well, I definitely see it almost turning back to the troubadour years. Um, I saw a great band last night at the zoo, Lake Street Dive. And they're kind of a acoustic, uh, old-fashioned band. And they broke through because of a YouTube video that showed them playing on the street doing a cover of Michael Jackson's I Want You Back. Mm. It sure takes, this is a young woman singing it, but let me say it sure takes some balls to sing that song, which is a classic. And she does it so fantastically. Now, can, can we, and this is the new paradigm that we live in, What's the name of the band? Lake Street Dive. Lake Street Dive. Can Pedro in an instant call them up? And can we hear them? Well, that's a good question. Well, yes. it's Pedro, so oh, it take a while. Probably. Yes. Pedro, it's possible. <laughs> Pedro is like the, the soup is, Nazi of new music. Is that the the way. YouTube has <laughs> destroyed the music industry. Now, 80% of all music, it, people encounter 80% of all new music mm-hmm. through YouTube. So that's where people find new music more than any other outlet now. I've read this, yeah. And there's a lot of crap up there, Mm -hmm. and a lot of bad stuff gets through. But you get something like Lake Street Dive, a great band. And so, and it's killing me because I have to mention, I'm sorry, Charles, but Josh Ritter was here yesterday. He was, In the Carter Subaru Live Theater. So if anybody missed it, you can just call it up at Mm. 957kjr.com. He was quite something, by the way. Yes, he was He's from Moscow, Idaho. He and I are the only two people in the music industry ever to come out of eastern Washington, Idaho. He's a doll. (laughs) (laughs) It's a desert over there. I don't know if you've heard. Yeah, I I do know. Uh, Mm. 
But in any case, my point is, is that, uh, you know, a band that's a good band can break through and find an audience. And, you know, there were 4,000 people there to see Josh and them, but they, they, uh, they're on the way up, partially because of a YouTube video. But you have to play live. They can't be making hardly any money from their record sales, even though they put out a couple of yes, records. Yes, and that's, that is the new paradigm, is that the music sales business is in shambles. But, conversely, the live touring business has never been better. Whether you're a nostalgic act, whether you're a guy like Buddy Guy, and he's, uh, how old is he, playing casinos and w- almost, he's, he's in his 70s. 70s, late 70s, or you're a young band, and we meet a lot of these young bands touring, driving around in a van like the old days, going from city to city, and they build a following and they build a reputation. This is the band you were talking about? Yeah. Hear that. What a voice this man's got. I mean, you just listen to five seconds of it and you go, this is a voice, you know. And this is them live, right? Yeah. And of course, I'm old enough that I Want You Back was one of the very first singles I ever remember hearing on the radio. It was like one of my entrees into the world of pop music. So... It was a classic. It was a Michael Jackson song. People don't mess with Michael Jackson songs, um, you know, but, but she did, and they turned it into a great song. Why did you decide? Do you remember when you decided, or was it not a decision to write about music? You know, what's weird is I began to go to the UW to study architecture, but I somehow failed in my... Uh, you know, advanced work to discover that you had to take two years of math and science before you could take a single architecture class. So I went to the UW and started working for the daily the first day I was there, and that was it. There was no decision beyond that. Journalism, the idea of writing and having people read it. Um, you know, right around that time, I saw Elvis Costello and wrote a review about him, and it was like, wow, I was off and running. My worst interview happened that year. I heard you talking a little earlier about interviews. The single worst interview I ever did in my career hmm. was with Buddy Rich, the famous Legend. Great drummer. jazz guy. Mm-hmm. Greatest jazz and drummer maybe of I, all time? Yeah, oh, I would say so, yeah. yeah. And I don't know how much I can say on the air, but how many people here have heard the Buddy Rich tapes? Nobody here? Yeah. But um, his 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 playing recording. No, is this these like are the Casey legend- Kasem when he was swearing at exactly. His these yeah. are some of the most legendary tapes. Yeah. I've heard of Buddy them. Rich was such a jerk and ripped his <laughs> band down yep. Yep. so often really? that his band began recording him. And I think I can say one part of it. He basically repeats again and again and again to his band. I'm up here sweating my balls off, and you guys are doing blankety blank nothing. Mm-hmm. So he really was truly the biggest. You jerk call that in the old world. school motivational therapy. Right. <laughs> but it was out of control. It was so bad when it was hard to get a tape recorder. They were secretly. It was the NSA. His band was taping him. Mm-hmm. And those tapes over 30 years in the era before YouTube leaked around. I had not heard those tapes. I was sent into this interview with this maniac who didn't want to be talking to a college kid, and every single answer was one word. You'd ask him a long question about a song or something. Mm -hmm. You were basically trying to open him up to empower him to share with you, which is what a great interviewer does, Right. and he was taking none of it. So I printed the interview verbatim. And I think the only one... By the way, did you notice the answer to his question was, yep. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Learned from the great ones. (laughs) No, but then you continued on, which is what I was hoping for. Yes, go ahead. And, you know, I put, I I ran it verbatim in the University of Washington Daily. The only one thing that was a sentence was his last sentence, which was a suggestion that I might want to... Um, you know, have sexual intercourse with myself. Um, No kidding. And I printed it verbatim, Mm -hmm. and Buddy Rich called up the paper and threatened to kill me. Nice. Wow, that's one of a number of people who have threatened my life. Well, you're almost Uh, in his band at that point. That's a serious (laughs) one. I'm okay from him. (laughs) uh, That's crazy, because uh, you've met a lot more bands than I have, but it's usually the drummer who is the nicest guy in the band. Mm -hmm. That's almost certain in every single band. The drummer is usually the nicer guy. Well, the drummer gets very little respect, but the drummer's so important. Mm. 
Um, you know, one of the the best drummers, I'm sure he's probably been on your show, is John Worcester, who's the drummer of Bob Mould's band and a bunch of other groups and Super Chunk. He's a comedian. The drummers often are the funniest guys, and the interviewers don't want to talk to them, but you get the best stories from oh, the yeah. drummer. Who's the guy we talked to, one of the Wrecking Crew guys? Uh, Hal Blaine. Hal Blaine. Oh, yeah. guys played oh, interview. Interview. Have you ever interviewed him? Yeah. No, I haven't. Oh, he's... He, yeah, yeah, he's a walking uh, history book of uh, the music of the 60s. He recorded everything. And the guitar nice players guy. are the worst interviews. They are. And, and because? Well, because they have to almost be connected to their instrument. They're not so good at talking about it. Um, you know, they don't know how to explain what they do. It, 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 a really great player... It just comes to them. Jimmy Page is fantastic talking about production, about Led Zeppelin. But when it talks to actual playing, it's like, give me the guitar, Les Paul, and let me go at it. Last um, year, we spoke with Johnny Winter, rest in peace. And, uh, you know, it, it, he was a nice man, but he was a one-word answer guy. He let his guitar do the talking. He didn't have much to say. I think that was from the years he played with Buddy Rich. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at a transcript from uh, one of the Buddy Rich tapes, and I believe that we've all made a horrible mistake by not listening to these. This it's guy a great is tape. Insane Wait, can, is, there, is there a bleeped version of it? <laughs> no, it's I'm not gonna, possible. No. Is there, can, you read, can you read one sentence and kind of bleep out what he i mean this was what my interview with him was like i mean it was unbelievable do you know the portion about the beards when he was yelling at the guy about how they all had to shave their beards uh really yeah and and one of the guys was standing up to him and he said i'm not taking it off buddy rich said you're what he said i'm not taking it off he goes you're through right now you don't tell me what to do i tell you you don't like it get off when and where get off get your get off your effing clothes and get off this bus right now it says, says to the bus driver pull this bus over the guy says have you got two weeks pay for me buddy rich says have i got what he says have you got two weeks pay for me buddy rich says i got nothing for you i got a right hand to your effing brain if you want it wow. <laughs> so uh, charles yeah. so that was my start that was my <laughs> wow. that was my and and rich. if you and continue for some reason, i kept going with yeah this. if you continue oh, at that point you must really love it so uh, let me ask you another question so do stars sometimes let their egos go to their heads? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Who else can you think of that uh, you know was way too uh, way too sure of themselves? Oh God, there's um, almost been too many. Uh, you know, in the '80s, the heavy metal bands were out of control with ego. Um, you know, there's a there's a story. I I did an interview him, but one of my very favorite uh, you know Eddie Van Halen stories is there's a story in Heavier Than Heaven of Nirvana's touring, and then they have Pat Smear in the band, who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is has Arab background. He's not white as snow. Eddie Van Halen drunk on his ass. They're going to meet. Nirvana's going to meet Van Halen for the first time. It's one of Kurt's idols. And Eddie is so drunk, and he kept referring to Pat Smear as that little Mexican. Um, where's the little Mexican? Blah, blah, blah. Just being totally, totally racist. no idea. The biggest yeah. idiot mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. earth having no perception of who Nirvana was. And for Kurt Cobain, who had grown up idolizing, listening to KSW play yeah. Van Halen for oh. years, he meets this guy who's just a drunk and a jerk. Mm. Um, now, of course, uh, Eddie had his substance abuse problem at the time. Yeah. So it's kind of like a Mel Gibson thing. Yeah, I don't know. I think <laughs> I, personally, I think that whether you're drunk or not, if you kind of fall you into do that, that it's racism, it it's shows. revealing who you really are. I don't think Jin exactly. was talking with Mel Gibson. By the way, yeah. I'm not. Art. I'm not for Mel Gibson yeah. in this right, scenario. Right, right, I'm right. just saying that yeah. I, I've heard the first time I've heard anybody defend <laughs> Mel Gibson. Well, I know. Whoopi the other day was defending a guy. I figured I'd try that on. No, let me ask you this though, because and this is where I I feel a synergy with you. I have this passion for having musicians really uh, reveal what's good about them. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some jerks, and there's always the jerk stories, but there's also some people that are quite amazing. We spoke with Richard Marks recently, and he was so zen, and he was such a philosopher. Who are the guys, maybe one or two, that blew you away with how balanced and self-aware they were and, and, and what uh, you know, really mature people they were? Well, most of them are people that are older. Very few young stars, mm -hmm. you know, it are comes with time. You know, kind of hap that has that happen. And most of them also are more balanced. Um, you know, Sarah McLaughlin, um, you know, somebody that loves music and really wants, if you're interviewing her, to look at you, to talk to you, to have a personal relationship. It's not about from one city to the next, on and on. Um, you know, the, a lot of the the 
grunge era bands in Seattle, one of the things that was special about them is they did want a relationship, particularly with the local press. They treated you very different if you were local press than if you were national. You know, there was a point where Pearl Jam was so big that they would literally have a line of journalists waiting to go interview them, and you'd be getting your certain amount of time. You'd be getting your half an hour, and they'd have a timer that, you know, because they had, you know, flown all these people in. Every time I talked to any of those guys, they knew me, they knew we covered them early on. The timer went off. They talked on and on and on. They told stories they didn't tell to anyone else in any of the other interviews. Um, They knew it was important. They knew that being covered in the rocket early on when they were Mookie Blaylock, um, you know, helped create their career. So, you know, there were there those bands really did, you know, pay respect back to the local community. Charles Cross. Uh, I follow you on Facebook. You make some interesting posts once in a while. You're kind of a, uh, you speak truth to a lot of things. You also uh, mentioned your son recently. I think the two of you were on a camping trip or something. It was very touching. We went away for a week with Unplugged in an island in Canada, and he loved it. No Facebook, no internet, for one day, no electricity. It was absolutely awesome. You're saying he loved it, I don't sense any sarcasm. I no, like he, was he not. loved it. He absolutely loved it. Afterwards, I said, what was the best part about the vacation? He said, being unplugged. He had his guitar. He had his Cat Steven tabs. He was raring to go. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, the irony here, though, is it was one of the most beautiful Facebook posts yes. I had ever read. I got to share this on Facebook. I read that. It was great stuff. <laughs> it was very nice. <laughs> Charles, we're going we're to put up a link. Uh, if you haven't friended Charles on Facebook, uh, I don't know how picky he is. He's probably picky. He's a critic. Uh, but also, uh, if you haven't read any of his books, uh, his biographies, uh, they are all, they bring you inside uh, the world of some of your famous, uh, most famous people from Seattle. We'll put some links at BobRivers.com. And when we get back, we do, uh, I believe, have some of the Buddy Rich tapes ready right. to go. Oh, we can edit them? All right. Yeah. Charles R. Cross, thank you very much. Sir. You're welcome. I'm glad I brought Buddy Rich to you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> the FCC finds the 